Well, I think we're about ready to start. Others will be coming on. As you know, this is all on um, YouTube. It's on the it's on the parish the, the cathedral website. But it it I also have my lesson, my written lesson for today. It will be posted probably tomorrow. I didn't get a chance to put it together, uh, so I have it. It's just it'll be posted tomorrow. Well, let's begin with uh, a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to read this, that part of the scripture today uh, of the A cycle. There was A and B. The A cycle was from uh, with, with parishes that have the RCIA. And since we have that here in the, in the cathedral, we had the A cycle, which is the, rising, the raising of Lazarus. And then Jesus says this to Mary and to um, Martha at the tomb of uh, Lazarus. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. For everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. You believe this. Then Jesus perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone lay across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha said, the dead man's sister said, the Martha, the dead man's sister, said to Jesus, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for, your, hear, for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And then Jesus, when he said this, cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial ties. And his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said, unbind him and let him go free. Now, many of the Jews who had come out to Mary and Martha seen what Jesus had done and they began to believe in him. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, hear us. And having instilled in your servants the teachings of your Christian faith and truth, graciously purify them. And by the power of this sacrifice, work within them. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, this is our fourth, our fifth and last session on our journey together, reflecting on God's forgiveness and his healing of our emotional and spiritual wounds. But I stress again that what we have been doing these past five weeks is only a continuation. I did a series on prayer back in October. And remember, I stress the Our Father, teach us how to pray. And I go back to that because this, this is only a continuation of that prayer session. Remember, it's in that prayer that Jesus taught us that, first of all, he focuses on the Father. And my first sessions here was all about God, how the Father and Jesus Christ, how they, they God forgives us. And then... Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And to receive the forgiveness of God. And then to forgive others by the power of his working in us. And so it's so important because, you know, it's, we're listening. Now I'm studying. I've studied. And Charmaine has scripture study. We read the, the catechisms of the Catholic Church. Uh, we read other maybe spiritual authors or uh, they're reputable. Um, and this is absolutely essential. All this listening to talks and improving our prayer life is very important. Ongoing education uh, that deepens our knowledge and informs us about our faith and the truths about God. In fact, it even says that in that prayer that I said today, um, must continue throughout our lives. But knowledge about God is only the first step. Knowledge is not going to empower us We've got to know. Remember, there was the, the, the king and I, 
uh, who was it, Deborah Carr, whoever it was, the teacher, you know, she went to Thailand, which was Siam at the time. And she sang this beautiful song, Getting to Know You, Getting to Know All About You. She was singing that to these kids, but she just didn't get to know them. And she had to actually teach them. She had to interact with them. She had to relate to them. So we have to, we have to get to know God and we have to then, we have to pray to him because that's where the power comes from, the relationship. The relationship. You know, we can, I taught, you know, Lectio Divina. The first two steps in Lectio Divina is the reading of scripture. Then that we call that the Lectio. And then there is the Meditatio. We've got to take the word of God and look in our life, see how do those two interact? How do they sort of like the warp and the wolf, you know, they make the fabric. And we have to think about that. But then we have to, Horatio, is to actually speak to the Lord. And then we have to listen that's the, and then there's the contemplatio, being in his presence quietly. Now, maybe in that Lectio Divina, maybe the Oratio doesn't, at the beginning, doesn't take a whole lot, but we have to eventually talk to him. I like to use the image of the, of the, of the swing in the seesaw. You know, you can get on a swing. You can maybe be listening, you know, to good lectures or beautiful music and on the swing. You don't need it. You could just do that all by yourself in a, in a, in a, in a playground if you're... <laughs> You don't mind people looking at you. And, and so you could, and it might be a beautiful day and you go up and down, you see the sky and then you get, oh, that's beautiful. It's wonderful. But you're there all by yourself. There's another thing called the seesaw on the playground. And you can't get on the seesaw unless somebody else is there. You just can't. The seesaw means it takes two. And so the, the Oratio is like the seesaw. You got to eventually talk to the Lord but at the same time on the seesaw, the other person has to be a part of that as well. You go up and down and they, you know, it goes up and down. It's an interaction. Oratio is interacting. And it's the relationship that empowers us. Every relationship, take a look at friendship, take a look at marriage, a loving relationship. A look with your good friends, with your family, with your siblings, with your parents. Relationship is never on automatic pilot. You know, I like automatic drive in a car, but when it comes to relationship, it's always gear shift. It's always gear shift. You, you, if you go on automatic pilot, that's why there's so many divorces. If you go on automatic pilot, and it doesn't work. It just doesn't. And it's in the relationship. And so that's why we can see things. Now you say, well, Father, you said all that once before. What are you going over it again? Because in a relationship, there's always a need to go over and over again. Not the same old stuff, dredging up the same old stuff. No, that's not the end. It's always new. Sing a new song to the Lord. There's how much, oh, we often say, that's in Psalm 96, that's Psalm 98, that's Psalm 9, you know, it, it goes, uh, it's over and over again. St. Augustine says, how is it these old song, these old songs, that they're new because he said, because the person who, who is praying them is renewed day by day. And so the, the, the word of love on the lips of the one who loves you is always new. It's always new. You know, you say, oh, you said that yesterday. No, no, it's, it's always new. And so we have a tendency to mix this whole idea that, well, I heard all about that. Now let's get on to something else. Let's get on with the show. The show is <laughs> being in one's presence. So we need both. It's like two hands washing one another. You can't just, you can't wash one hand which is without the other. In other words, it's, it's, it's the important thing. And so you say, well, you know, you go over and over and over and over. As I said, it's not just like going in a circle. It's like going in a spiral staircase. You're going around in circles, but the, the circles are taking you either going deeper or higher. Without this personal communion with Jesus, there, there's, there, there's just no, nothing is, you know, I love Paul when he says, or Jesus says in chapter 15 of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me as I abide in you. Without me, you can do nothing. You can know a lot about God. I have no doubt there's theologians know a lot about God. You could know a lot about this woman, but knowing about her is not necessarily, necessarily loving her or your friend. And when we do that, Jesus will act. 
Do we ever have a tendency to think, maybe we don't believe enough that he will say, but I've been trying it, I've been trying it. But we need to also listen. That's why we've got to read. Now, is, is I pray the rosary. I'd love the rosary and other devotionals and I, I did the uh, uh, mercy uh, chaplet. But we also have to sit and open the scriptures and let the scripture speak to us. The, the daily readings, or you maybe just take the Sunday reading and take it throughout the week. And what happens is the Lord, his greatest desire, we did that the second series, the Lord's desire for us is to reveal the Father to us. How much will the Father, if, if we ask him to, for the Spirit, we're asking him for a lot of things, Lord, increase in me your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, reveal the Father to me. Do we say that in sin? Well, I said that, yes, I did that. I made a novena last week on that. No, no. <laughs> See, we have a tendency, I've been there, now I need to get something. We want to get some new territory. And, and so I say that again. And the Father and, and Jesus will reveal the Father. And as he reveals the, himself to us, his light will reveal ourselves to ourselves. I'll begin to know myself better. That's the important thing. Whenever the Lord says the truth will set you free, it's just not the truth, the objective truth about who God is, but also when it dawns on us who I am. Because as I said, I spent almost one whole talk on it, how blind we are to ourselves. We're good at blaming everybody else. Denial and projection is very, very common. It comes to us naturally. Join the human race. You're, you're a part of it, and I am. We do it ourselves. We have to catch ourselves over and over again. We, we, unless until we have faces, how can I face God unless I face myself? And that's why when we acknowledge that we're sick of heart, then there's a felt need. Lord, forgive me and heal me. And so then that's where then we have to say, not only do I have to receive it, but then I have to forgive. And that's not easy. It's not easy. Now, maybe to better understand, and I spent whole last week that, and I ended with a powerful prayer of renewal of our baptismal promises. That's what I ended with last week. But how often are we supposed to say that? That people, well, how long, how many times do I have to do that? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not a question to ask. How much, do you, when you're, are you thirsty? How many glasses of water do you have to drink a day? The rest of my life, I've got to do this. Come on, you have to get off the, I have other things to do. Like what? <laughs> See, I'm not, <laughs> these attitudes sort of condition us to ways that we don't even realize how we're being conditioned so that we don't do what really is good for us. And we try everything else. You know, when they say, when everything else work, doesn't work, read the instructions on the. <laughs> Why doesn't this work? Did you read the instructions? Well, I thought I could know how to do it. Well, read the instructions. <laughs> what the, the, the medicine in the cabinet is not going to do anything unless you swallow it. In our previous lectures, we, we focused on that. But to better understand that, we'll see that there is different nuance, there's different depths struggles to, to, to hurt the people, I mean, to forgive the people who hurt us. Sometimes we don't even realize that. You know, who were they? Now, when we take a look at reflecting on those who hurt me, first of all, it's a well-known truth that those whom we love the most hurt us the most deeply. It's obvious. Father, mother, siblings, grandparents, people who were very close to us. We still love them, but they, they, we hurt. And we don't even like to admit that. We like to excuse them, which maybe in one way is good, but it, uh, oh no, they did the best they could. Yes, they did the best they could, but they hurt me. Why did they hurt me? Because they were hurt by their parents. Oh, well, I'm not gonna blame them for what they did. Or, you know, during the depression, what we did. I, I understand, but if they hurt you, then you, I'm not saying you go up there and say, dad, you know, you hurt me when I was a kid. I'm not saying that, just to, to realize they've hurt me or your husband or your, your, your wife or your kid. Kids can hurt parents. 
wife and, and, and husband or each one another. Or maybe other family members, old friends. Who do you think hurt Jesus the most? Was it the high priests and, and they were mocking him? Or were Peter and, and, and the disciples who abandoned him? I don't know, you'd have to ask him, but I mean, it, it must not have been very easy. And what did Mary think at the cross? Where are they? What happened to them? No friends here? After what he did for them? So that's the first thing. Then there's the, as the, the circle widens, then there's our neighbors, our coworkers, members of the community we belong to, fellow parishioners. We live and work with them. We live next door to them, neighbors. Boy, they are, if you live in a condo, as a consequence, we see them often. Maybe we're working with them. And, and so it reminds us over and over again what they did to us. And they might be a very irksome people because, <laughs> you know. And so we have to forgive them over and over again. I'm not saying again that we tell them that, but before our, we have to bring those. But you see, that's a different category of people. Sometimes we see everything as one and it, it's different. It's a different section of our heart that has been wounded. The pain will come, but is it an ingrown toenail or is it, is it a headache or, or is it, you know, I have an infected kidney, you know? And then more broadly speaking, it's those people that we interact with. Maybe, I mean, we just meet haphazardly throughout the day. People in traffic, they do, we get very angry at people in traffic. People that we meet in publics, our business, or maybe our clients, maybe we're trying to get something on the phone, maybe get through to the to the the bank, to, you know, to do, and and they abruptly just turn us off or something. We get very angry at those people, you know, or when we watch the news, we get angry at that, and you know, why well, couldn't we? I mean, what's happening on the news? And we hear, and we go down these blogs, and and some of these people who are trying to be very orthodox. They also stir. They press all kinds of buttons. They seem to be happy to get. They're getting a rise out of us. They're trying to maybe prod us to do something. But are we watching this night and day? Some people. And then sometimes we just something reminds us of something that is that reminds us of our childhood hurts. What about people that hurt us when we were bullied in middle school? Or parents or teachers or anything. Sometimes we'll see something as, oh yeah, I remember what happened. And that, that takes us back into that old memory again. And so, you know, our, our teachers that we had. So these hurts recent or long ago, I think we take a look because sometimes people think anger is anger. No, there's different depths of anger. And to see that because sometimes people are just always angry. They're just always angry. It becomes like a, it's like the only music they hear. And so we have to go again, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we have to hear these words of Jesus. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. It will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. I said that again. You know, I say this often and sometimes, Father, you said that so often. Don't you get tired of saying it? No, but you seem like get, you get the impression you're tired of hearing it. But I mean, do you hear it or is it just like, there he goes again. The song of love is always a new song. See, we get this, well, we heard that. Let's get on to something else. There's nothing else. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is it. This is where we gain our strength. It goes deeper and deeper. A relation to always goes deeper. You're never going to say, well, yeah, my wife and I, we have our act together. That's never going to happen. <laughs> And, and again, Paul says, it is God who works in us to will and to act according to his good purpose. He pulls us into his good purpose. We're always trying to pull him into our good purpose, which he will do that in order to see, come to us so he can then pull us into his good purpose, which is to our ultimate glory. 
So looking at it, but I would say now I do. Now I'm going to just stop here. Does anybody have any questions? Why I, this is basically a review. I th well, I thought we were going to do something new here. He's going all over this again. <laughs> anybody? I'm going to stop here. Does anybody have any questions? First of all, we're just talking about questions. Any questions why I did what I did? It's to try to say we've got to pray into this. Pray with the Lord in this is what we have to do. Anybody going to hold their hand up? No. Okay. Well, let me go on. There's also, I would say, various categories, maybe. Of, first of all, there are what I call accidental or innocent hurts. Now, let's say you come to a, uh, a uh, retreat center, and I'm going to come to the, uh, that retreat. We're going to spend five, five days at a retreat center. And so we're parking. We're, we're, we're all parking. And I come in, and somehow, I don't know what, I lose, and I bump, in, and I dent your car, and I hit the, the back end of your car. I crush the back fender, and, you know, and I've even got it. And now you, I, I, I didn't want to do it. I'm sorry. Of course, I wouldn't have done it. Maybe you're thinking, I think he's just clussy. I don't think he should be <laughs> driving anymore. And especially now, especially if you can't open your trunk because, <laughs> because the trunk, and you wanted to take your, your suitcase out so you can start the retreat. I mean, you'll be ticked. I, I, I feel very bad about this. Maybe I shouldn't be driving, but I'm so sorry. Would you forgive me? Yes, you, you might not be easy. It's an innocent thing. Maybe I need to be more prudent. Maybe some, maybe somebody hit me. I don't know. Maybe the, you know, but it was accident. You still have to, you still have, it's not going to be easy. There's no mal, and I might say, what can I do? Obviously, I'm going to have to give you my insurance. <laughs> and, and, you know, and what can I do to make up for it? And maybe so forth and so on. And I'm, and I, you make, I feel very bad. You know, I feel bad. We can't shake it, especially if that's staying with you for some time. If the consequences go on, who knows what? Somebody does something that causes you, you know, uh, maybe something, or maybe even hurts you physically. You know, you just got over with a sprained ankle and I slip, step on your toe or somebody steps on your toe. I mean, it, you know, you say, oh my goodness, there we opened this whole thing again. Um, because also, not and and yeah, I know I think it's very appropriate. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. I know I'm sorry. I but certainly I forgive you, and we're going to work through this together. That's what you're saying, and I think it's very polite to do that. You certainly don't want to make me, you know, worse and say, well, you know, this was a dumb thing to do. Why, why are you still driving? I mean, you might feel that way, but I, I please don't tell me it right now. But anyway, but also to forgive me from not only in saying it, but to forgive me before God. First of all, to pray that maybe because you know, in spite of the fact that I caused you this hurt, that he will also relieve me and bring me into peace so that I'm not beating myself up in my embarrassment. So that I can also learn to begin to forgive myself for what I did, even I'm trying to help you in what I've caused you. And also that... You can forgive me because I, you're not blaming me. Maybe it was totally had nothing to do with it at all, my fault at all. It's like when somebody hits somebody behind me and they hit me, it's because they've been hit by somebody behind me in the traffic. It wasn't their fault. They got hit both in the front and the back. But you're still damaged. And I think we need to forgive. We have to forgive. Before, because otherwise, if we don't, this accumulates, and there's just like a big grab bag of anger, and it just see it's like throwing all the dead, all the dirty laundry in the same bin, so to speak, and it just becomes one cauldron of, of anger. Again, forgiveness is not blaming the other; it's setting that person free, not only by my words or for, or, or my forgiveness, but also asking God. You know, please, God, pray for this person because I know they're suffering from what they did to me. And also set me free as this, from this as well, from harboring this, being irked. So that's accidental hurt. Then there's perceived hurts. I was deeply hurt. 
but it was more of a perception from where I was. This happens a lot with kids, with us when we were children and with your children. You discipline your kids. They don't like it. When I was disciplined, I did not like it at all. When my father told me this or he told me that, I could not have it. And that was the end of it. We're not talking about it anymore. You know, I got an F. Well, maybe I needed to learn that lesson. It's the teacher's fault. Yeah, you right the other day. What? When I got over. Do you want to put your hand up? No. Oh, okay. So, um, when I was disciplined as a child by maybe a parent, a teacher, a coach, a priest, I maybe I needed to hear it. At the time, I didn't need to hear it. Now, maybe at the time, whenever you're seven, eight, nine years old, you don't think of forgiveness. But I think when you go back over it now, because we might have some grievances against our parents or a teacher, it might go back into forget and, and to say, my son, this is a perceived hurt. I needed it for my own welfare. Or maybe when I was disciplined as a coworker, or by, or I mean by a boss. I mean, you know yourself, if you're in supervision or if you were a teacher, you had to discipline, they didn't like it. But, but, but it's a perceived hurt. Now, maybe they could have done a little better. Maybe how they did it was not the best, but I need, still needed to hear that lesson. I needed, I needed to be taught, to, and, and because otherwise, I'd become very undisciplined. There's a thing called tough love. And to go back and say, yes, maybe my father was in certain instances, you know, unjust in what he did. But in these cases, he really did give me, a, he, he, he helped me a lot. He taught me very good lessons that have really to this very day have held me, you know, have, have have been a great gift to me. Over time, the sting of being reprimanded or corrected will fade. And so I think we need to if, even forgive that. that. You'll say, that's where people will excuse. I'm not saying we're blaming them. But wherever we've been hurt, I really believe we need to forgive. Because I know when I, I as the bishop, once he sent me to a place, I did not want to go there at all. Oh, and I felt very, I thought to myself, everything that, I, why are they sending me there? And I, and I had very good reasons to feel that way, I thought. And I told some of my friends and they agreed with me. <laughs> but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I was obedient. I maybe grit my teeth a little bit. You know, I'm not saying that that was an ideal obedience, but I knew that somehow Christ was obedient and I must be obedient in his obedience. We all suffer this, but I still had to forgive my bishop. Now, I didn't realize it at the time when I was, I was forgiving him, but really I had nothing to really, he wasn't really guilty of anything. But if I had not brought that to prayer, I don't think I would have ever come as quickly as I did. Because whenever you say, Lord, in your name, Jesus, I forgive them, he comes into that hurt and he begins to open up the reasons why that maybe I didn't see. So I'm bringing him into the hurt, even though maybe it's my own self-pity that's hurting. Nevertheless, he will be the healer as well to open up the bigger picture that I was not able to see with my own limited view. Just because I came to these conclusions didn't mean that those are the conclusions that, I, that were the best to come to. My vision was, in some way, I didn't think that I was absolutely, you know, totally in the right, but I just felt like maybe 90% I was. <laughs> and so we learned that. Lord, forgive, help me to forgive so that I can see the bigger picture. Because if I don't start by asking you to heal me, and to, I'll never go take the next step with you being with me. Lord, you're going to work in me to will and to act according to your good purpose. See, the Lord had a bigger purpose that I could not see. And maybe the bishop didn't even realize. And, I, and as a result, I learned something very important about myself. 
and about the Lord. And I went to a place that was a blessing. But I have to tell you, when I packed my bags and I went there, my emotional aff affection were not in those bags. It was my clothes. <laughs> and I did say to the people, I, you know, the, the Lord, I know, has blessed me for being, I, knew, I believe that, although I didn't feel that. In other words, you know, have you ever had your baggage not show you maybe you didn't show up you know maybe you, you arrived at your destination and your 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 your, your baggage was uh, was delayed. Eventually, it came up to me, and my affective love for these people did more than I could have imagined. It takes time, and so there that what's the accidental hurts? There are these perceived hurts which only maybe take time before I perceive them as that, but I still need to forgive. Say, oh, well, you know, he did the best he could, but nevertheless, it hurt me and I forgive him. I didn't tell him that, of course, <laughs> but I said that to myself and to the Lord, I asked him. Now, then there's other hurts that are real damaging hurts. The other two are not really, I mean, they still damaged, but they were never, they were never an affront to me personally. It was, they were not unjust in that sense. Nobody was out to hurt me. But there are people who do hurt us. And they're caused by people who have been hurt themselves in life. These people were hurt, but they neglected or refused to forgive and heal. So they carry that around. The dark spirits of resentment which we looked at last session has been eating away at them and they, they react out of that. It's poisoned their ability to relate respectfully. I'm not even saying lovingly. They have been wounded emotionally and spiritually and this infection seeps into their relationships. They foster a disposition of being defensive and combative. Before you strike me, I'll hit you in the face. They're very combative. They're very defensive. They wear an armor. You know, wearing, having calluses on our hands is a sign that I'm working hard. And yet my dad had calluses and I had calluses on my hand. So I would, then when I went to, <laughs> then I went to this college and I, was, I wasn't working with my hands as much, my dad said, oh boy, you're losing the calluses. In other words, I'm getting soft. <laughs> so calluses have a good, re have it, you know, they protect the skin, but it's not good to have calluses on your heart. And that's what people do. They have to protect themselves. So they get hard, they get, you know, a rough surface. It's not easy. I know it is. That's why forgiveness and healing is so important. And if they are in authority, oh, oh watch out. That's the problem with priests, bishops, bosses, teachers, parents, fathers, mothers. They've been wounded themselves. Now they're in authority. And that, that somehow put, gives an edge to them. And especially if you have a boss or something, they can be very controlling. And usually what happens is they're very controlling to cover up the inner nagging of their own insecurity. I have no doubt they're probably very insecure because they've been hurt. They're, they're very down deep in their heart. They prove the old adage, people who are hurting hurt others. You know, uh, there was a beautiful um, book by um, Father Nowen, Henry Nowen, Wounded Healers. We've all been wounded. And if we really are healing our wounds, we become more compassionate. But if we don't heal those wounds, we become wounded wounders. And this is what happens. Parents can be that way. Teachers, bullies, in-laws, coworkers. They feel they've been overlooked in life or rejected or by someone they love, but who maybe dumped them. Maybe they were given a lot of hurt in their life. I'm not saying that they don't have good reasons to feel that way. But they've neglected to go there and to admit it and ask, well, what, is there anything in your past? Oh, no, no, no. I don't believe that he's dredging up. No, 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 no. That's all over. That's, let bygones be bygones. 
and yet they carry it with them. They grow a tough skin and they tend to be defensive and harsh with the same attitudes of people who wounded them. I must forgive them as difficult as it is or I'll become like them. Oh, I would never do that. I would never be that way. I'm not that kind of person. Don't ever say that. You know, I'm not that kind of person. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. That person has an image of herself or himself and thinks that that's who I am. Well, where everybody else is saying, can't she see what she's doing? Can't he see what he's doing? So I can become ir irritable, defensive, distant. And not that this doesn't happen to us, everyone. We're, when we're in a bad mood, this happens to us. I can't, I, it does, that's all. And then we go, I'm sorry, catch ourselves. And we fall on our face. It's always baby steps, brothers and sisters. So that is what I said. First of all, accidental hurts, then perceived hurts, and real hurts done by people who were hurt themselves and who hurt us. And then the last one, which, well, there's probably more. I'm just saying four. There's probably more than four. Destructive hurts caused by malice. People who actually hate. That's terrible. We see it. And the person nurses anger and develops into resentment over a long, long time. They leave an open door to evil. The evil one comes and makes a nest in them. They don't even realize it, but they've harbored a guest. They leave the door open for the spirit of malice, which is an evil spirit, the spirit of Satan who hates us. And the evil one worms his way into their hearts to foster an, an evil intent. They love to see people tortured. It's we see that. They love to be destructive. It's amazing. When Jesus speaks about who the devil is, who Satan is, it's in chapter 8 of John, 844. He says he's the father of lies and a murderer. And they ultimately get, they kill. Malice killed Jesus. He killed Jesus. The, the evil one working in them killed Jesus. Every morning we pray the, the canticle of Zechariah. God promised of old that he would save us from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. Evil hates us. And of all the hurts that we experience, these are the most difficult. We see it even when we see it, when we see it on television or we see these people suffering. It just wrenches our hearts. We don't even want to look at it. It's terrible. Those who killed Jesus, they killed him out of malice and he forgave them. This is probably the most deepest wound and we have to make very careful that we don't let this wound in us make us an unforgiving person to all the other hurts that I spoke of. Of all the wounds inflicted upon us, this is the most difficult. And this will take a lifetime. And it will catch us every once in a while. And so we have to ask just how poor we are in this. Now I'm going to stop. Now, you, some of you may have some questions because I covered these four categories. Does anybody have any, first of all, questions? And then if, if not questions, is there any, maybe have some reflections? Anybody? Father, what was that prayer? Father, what was that prayer that you said whenever something bad happens, you invite Jesus in when you use that example? What's the prayer that you use? Well, I, you mean from last year, last week or what? Uh, when you were telling the story about the bishop and you brought Jesus into the situation and you well, said, well, no, I just, I just brought, I it was using my, I was a sponge. It wasn't no one formula. I just said, Lord, help me to forgive him what he's done to me. It's just, that's all I said. 
I mean, there's no formula. You just talk to him in prayer. You just say, Lord, maybe I probably would. I, I was reading some probably, I would probably was going over the, because the, the, I repeat it so often because I pray it often, was probably when I ask, I always say, whenever I take the chalice, Lord, give me the grace to forgive with your power of your forgiveness, the people who hurt me. Every time I take the chalice, every time I receive the Eucharist, at every single mass, that's what I ask for. That's why I tell the people. I'm on telling the people what I'm doing. It's not like one prayer you do. It's just the words of the scripture. Jesus' words inspire then you to work and to ask for the very thing he wants to give you. He's giving you his body as, and in his body is the blood of forgiveness. Whenever we receive, how many times I'll say that at, um, you know, when I'm offering mass, you know, say, but the word and my soul shall be healed. What are you going to ask for when you're coming up to communion? What are you going to ask for to heal and to forgive? Who are you going to ask to forgive? Just that's when you come. You do it then. He'll bring it to your time if you ask him. Well, that's, that, that's years ago. I was only 10 years old at the time. If it's bringing up, you better go there. Better go there. I was just reading if there were these chicadas, you know, these, these, these like uh, locusts or they, they're come, they're, they're, they've been in the ground for 17 years. They're finally coming out. <laughs> they're alive, they're alive out down there in that ground for 17 years. <laughs> they're going to come out and make a lot of noise. There's a lot of our memories are like that. <laughs> Anybody you, else? Any other question? Did I answer your question, Lisa? Thank you, Father. Yeah. I mean, if we're off, if we're going to mass, it's right there. If we would stop and think, this is what we're praying. Uh, Jeff and 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 Suzanne asked me, "What, Father? What is your favorite prayer?" I said, "The Eucharistic prayer is my favorite prayer. Mm -hmm. It's a prayer to the Father." Because right after the Eucharistic prayer, what do we pray? We pray the Our Father. <laughs> the Our Father. Wow. The Eucharistic prayer comes out of the Our Father. And the Our Father comes after the Eucharistic yeah. prayer in the liturgy. Anybody else? Any other? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's uh, Suzanne. <clears throat> so, uh, so Father, when we've been hurt um, in that that last uh, example that you gave, the just that malice, that malice. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, or being hurt by the by the wound, the people who, because the people who wound us, they're not necessarily malicious. I mean, people have wounded me because they've been hurt, but I'd never, I they, they really don't have a, they don't want to destroy me. I mean, they're hurting out of their own hurt. There, so there's a difference between the people who are wounded wounders and the people who are out to kill. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. My, so which which one is the third category or the fourth one that I mentioned? I want to speak to the fourth. The fourth okay. category. Uh, okay, good. Okay. People who are truly malicious. Yeah. And they, so we spend time, I, I mean, I, I would spend time and have spent time in prayer um, to help me to forgive that person. Yeah. But the pain is still there. Oh, yes. So, so my question is, as we truly forgive is our pain relieved? I think that's a very difficult question to answer because I, I'm not so sure. I think what happens is the pain becomes less controlling. Mm. But not, maybe it still remains. But it's less controlling. It's not the center of our, that whatever it is is no longer the center of our attention. Because if it is something very, very deep, but, but maybe what kind of pain is it? Is it the pain of resentment or is it also the pain that evil itself just creates a sense of, you might say, ugliness? You know, it, it, what kind of pain is it? There's a pain that we harbor because we've been hurt. And then maybe just the pain that, that Jesus, when he prayed over, over Jerusalem, he was pained. And he wept because he saw that they were going to be, they were destroying themselves, but it did cause him pain. So maybe you take a look, what kind of pain? Maybe the pain is being 
being transformed into another kind of pain because I think evil should always cause us pain. It should always cause a disturb us. And it doesn't necessarily control us or then rob us of our joy because even in pain, joy is deep inside of us. It comes from the relationship with the Lord, not the circumstances surrounding the, but that, then that's where uh, joy abides. I don't know, am I helping you or not? Yes, thank you, that's, yes. It's a mystery, I, I mean, to, to Suzanne, it's a mystery. We'll never really understand truly the mystery of evil. It really is very difficult to, for us to, you know, to try to understand it fully, but it does cause pain because it causes loss maybe. Or how could somebody really do that? You know, there's something that I really believe that is the beauty of the resurrection, because you see, when Jesus came, he showed him his hands and his side. These killed him. They caused him pain. Now they've been transformed. We're not there. But these wounds that you have received and people have, and I received, they're being slowly transformed. And that's why I, yes, uh, by his wounds, we are healed. And by his wounds, that's why I love to take this blood because it's the blood transfusion of forgiveness that slowly, slowly transforms those. So the, our woundedness will become signs of victory. And it's out of those wounds, if you truly, that you can begin to be more compassionate to others. And that's where they lose their power because the person who is stuck in that malice cannot be there for another. They're isolated. And the more of these wounds, even though the pain still remains, it becomes now an impetus to be there for others, to open our eyes. Instead of this, it's this, but it takes time. He can heal us in our wounds because his wounds were transformed by the power of his father working in him. Does that help? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. You know, when we cry over wounds, I think we should sit with Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane because he looked at the Mount of Olives and he looked at Jerusalem. That's before, I'm not talking about the time of his passion, but about a week before that. And he, he wept over Jerusalem. Say, Lord, what are you weeping over? Would that I could weep over what you're weeping over and not somehow spilled over my own wounds that, I, that I'm nursing and that I see it. Let me see it. I would like to see even my own woundedness, how you see it through your eyes so that I can weep with you and not weep alone because your tears will be there helping me to be freed. Anybody else, any other question or clarification? How do I get a recording? Um, I, I didn't uh, get here on time, so I was just wondering, how do I get the recording? Uh, you can get to, at the end of this, uh, Charmaine will tell you at the end, okay? Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, good. And I will have the text. Obviously, I have the text, but I, I opened it up with more examples than that. But you'll have the text. Uh, uh, you can download the text probably Monday or Tuesday. Okay, Lori. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Uh, yes, Father, I have a question. What virtue do you recommend to develop in order to get better at forgiving, forgiving people? Well, instead of, I would, you, I, I'm glad you mentioned, asked that question, but I would, I would ask that in prayer to the Lord. Lord, what do you want to give me? See, ask him. Okay. Lord, what do you want to give me? Because how do you want me to do this? Rather than maybe, yes, he, you see, I mean, these virtues are very good because we see the virtues through the idea of when the healing grace of the Lord comes, theologically speaking, we see that they are virtues. Maybe like patience or what have you. But say, Lord, you know, you show me. Now you might say, well, I think, do you think he will, he should, if you really say, oh, how, do, how do I, see, if you take, when you go to communion, 
and you see how he has been acting. You look at his actions. How did he act towards the, his, his enemies? Look at that, his attitude. Say, Lord, I would like to have this attitude that you had. Remember, it's not only his actions and his words that reveal his, who he is. It's his attitude. The way he dealt with them. His patience. But at the same time, when he had to say, speak candidly, he did. You know, I mean, and when you look at that and you say, how did he, how do we, were you able to do that, Lord? How were you able to act like that? I want to act like you acted. So in other words, you want to be more like him. It's, it's the relationship. It goes back to the relationship. I don't know, am I asking? In other words, take it that from that point of view. In other words, instead of coming through the front door of which virtue through the back door of sitting with him around your kitchen table and speaking to him. This is what you did. I wish I could do that what you did. Mm. Okay. See what I mean to do that? I, and this is just a similar, you know, how are you so patient with her? How did you speak to him? So I can't do that. Empower me to do that. I've been holding this on. Look at I've been holding on to this memory for such a long time. Give me a, how how help me to, to get rid of it. No, no. How would he, would he say that? Or he would say, help me to heal, help me to not let it control me. See, he, nobody controlled him. I don't have that freedom. I don't have it. <laughs> He'll give it to you if you ask him over and over again. It's the relationship. It goes back to the relationship. In other words, getting to know you, getting to know all about you. And that's why to know that, to have that sense of, I'm speaking to someone who wants to heal me more than I even want to be healed myself. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you, Father. Yeah. Again, I'm saying go back to the sense of that he's there for me. He's there for me. Give you an example. I mean, this is not exactly about healing, but it's against, uh, let's say, loves that he have. I remember a woman came into, ch into the church and she just, because she was a very staunch Lutheran, a very good Lutheran, and, and she a very holy person, but she never had in her background, she never had a devotion to Mary. How do I get this devotion to Mary? See, how do I get this devotion to Mary? Do you have any prayers that I could have? Do you have any books that I could read? I said, yes, I do. But before you do that, do you think that Jesus loved his mother? Uh, like most people love their mothers. Do you think he loved his, his mother with a full, tender and affectionate heart? Oh, yes, she said. I said, well, then ask him to share his affection with his mother with you. Oh, I never thought of that. See, she could talk to, she could speak very openly. She had a devotion to Jesus. Well, Jesus, just share your affections for your mother with me. I want to get to know your mother through relating to you. See, his affections for his mother, finally, over time, you know what, you know what really helped her as she was praying this? It was on a Palm Sunday when they were reading the Passion of Jesus, where Jesus said, to his beloved disciple, here is your mother. That's that struck her. His words, then, if he gave her to his beloved disciple, and I'm his beloved disciple, just before he died, it's one of the greatest gifts. And that gave it to her. But she prayed for maybe about a week, a year on that. And she had a very dear devotion of Jesus because it was Jesus that gave her that. Although I could give her some books and some prayers on it. And these books and prayers would help her. But who knows she, who knows Mary better than anybody? You see what I'm talking about? Yes. And so I'm going to end now. I'm going to have a very short time. I'm going to end with setting, I have some other things to say, but I had the homily today. 
Now, if you can, I, I, at the cathedral, it was 11 o'clock mass. It was because we had, the, we had the A readings, which is the raising of Lazarus. Maybe you went in your parish, they had the B readings, but with, an, uh, with a parish that has the RCIA and, and the scrutinies, then we have the A. So we had the A. And it's, I, I started out with, I, this is what I opened this with. When Jesus said, come out, Lazarus. Now, kairos, kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, is a Greek word which means time of opportunity or time of fulfillment or time of blessing. And there is this ecumenical group that goes around. And I was a pastor, as a pastor, I would, I, maybe about five years or so, I was working in a Kairos group, go to prisons. And I remember this one prison, because at this, these men who in prison, now there are many, many people who are like the, 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 the you know, the thief that cursed Jesus until his death on, on, on the cross. But then there's the other, there's the good thief as well. And there are a lot of these people, I'm not saying the majority, but a lot of them are really converted. In, when they're in prison, because they start reading the Bible, they start praying, and before you know it, they and there, there may be people come in to minister to them and the Kairos. And this fellow got up. He said he he opened his hands like this. He said, "I am free, free, free." This is his fifth Cairo. He was in prison maybe about eleven years. He said about five years ago I came. He said when I came to this prison eleven years ago, I was handcuffed. I was so violent that they shackled me. And I was in a rage because of, and I didn't know why I was angry. I was just angry ever since I was a kid. I don't know why I was angry, but I was just angry at being angry. And I was doing, and he killed, he killed actually, he was in there for murder. So they were many years ahead of him yet. But he said, now I'm free. Because he said, about five years ago when I came to Kairos, and I heard my, some of my brothers who were in prison, who were giving their testimony like I'm giving my testimony now. And you men, you ministers and priests and that coming here, you were there for me. And I started to dawn on me what was happening. And he said, and I, and I realized it was my resentments. I was hurt. I was angry and rightly so. And I was hanging on to it. But it was making, it was killing me. And he said, and I, and I started saying, Lord, help me. You see, Lord, help me. I, I'm helpless. He said, and I had like a, I had something like, it's something I hurt here. He said, and I realized that somehow the Lord was piercing my heart. He was forgiving me. And then I realized I do have a heart. I'm not a heartless person. I do have a heart. But that was painful. But it was a pain that I, it was like, you know, like when you're if you're if you just have a feeling that maybe when you say your your hand goes to sleep or something, you know, and then all of a sudden the blood starts coming in and it's it's, it's very uncomfortable. But he said it was like I was beginning to feel my heart, but it was painful. But he was healing me. But that pierced, that piercing was also the beginning of healing. And it took me some time because he said, because I, you gave me some of the Bible, you gave me, I was reading the, I was reading the scriptures. I, then I was reading it with a sense, Lord, you revive this heart of mine. And he said, now I'm free. I'm still here. I'm not going to get out of this place for, for years, but I'm free. I'm free of my resentments. I've been forgiving. I'm, I'm surrounded by hatred here by many of these men but I'm free. And that's what we're talking about, freedom. Even in his position where he's still incarcerated. And this healing now, this is not, this, it, it can be hurtful, but it's not torture. You know, even the athletes will say, what do they say? No gain, no pain, no gain. You go to a physical therapist, it's going to be well, maybe you have a surgery on your knee or something. You get around. it's very painful. <laughs> and then it's not a torture chamber. If you look at it as a torture chamber, you're not going to go back. But it's pain unto healing. But the Lord is the physician as well. That's why healing, forgiveness, and healing, and then to start to forgive others. And this man was what? He was a man with a heart. Was it still painful maybe to go back to Suzanne? Yes, it probably was. 
what he had to suffer growing up. He came from a very, very hard life. But it's, he was hardened by that hard life. But he was said, I'm free. He didn't say, I'll show you. I, have you ever seen a picture of Christ like this? Have you ever seen it? <laughs> How can a Christian do that? <laughs> I'm not saying we don't feel like doing that. I'm not saying I never did do that. <laughs> I'm not saying that. That's why we need to be forgiven. We need to be healed so that he can say, I'm free. This man, you would say, he's not free. He still has 20 more years. That's the way we look at it. I end with what Paul said that I said before. Be angry, but sin not. We have bound to get angry, but do not let the sun go down on your anger and give the evil one an opportunity to work on you. Oh, he loves angry heart. <laughs> the evil one knows nothing about forgiveness. Absolutely nothing. When you start to go and speak about forgiveness, he's off the He doesn't even know what you're talking about. He knows about it, but he doesn't know it. It's like looking at Chinese characters. You look at that and you say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. And that civilization, look what they did. They built the wall that they had the five, you know, technology and so forth, the long tradition of, and those characters. Forgiveness is like Chinese characters to the, to the evil one. It doesn't know what it's all about. So speak the language of forgiveness and you don't, and the evil one doesn't know what you're talking about. But resentment, oh, you're writing, you're writing, playing ball with him. <laughs> and what does he say? Let all bitterness, this is, this is, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice be put away from you. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. We're only handing on what has been given to us. Have I really accepted it? And yes, that will be painful, but I can become more compassionate and it's no longer controlling me. It'll snag me every once in a while, but it will not be center stage of my life, that litany of woes that I had last week, and pray that often in the name of Jesus Christ, I claim my identity. I am a daughter, a son of the Father, your beloved disciple. Why should I let people tell me that's not who I am? Claim your identity, there's power. John says in the first chapter, and those believe, who believed in his name, he gave them power, authority, as children of the Father. And so this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and your names, whoever you are here, Joseph, Mary Alice, Sophia, Linda, Cheryl, Suzanne, Kathy, Trudy. He knows your history. I don't know your history. He knows your history the more than you. And he wants to seep that into every corner of your, every, every crevice where there is any hurt. Whether it be an accidental hurt, whether it be a perceived hurt, whether it be a wounded hurt from a wounded person who wounded you, or whether it be malice. He wants you to die like he died, a free man, a free person. Or like that prisoner said, I'm free. I came here like this and I'm free. And when you take of his body, there's a blood transfusion. Ask for his healing. His and think of the people you need to forgive when you're coming up to communion. 
And when you go back to your, your, your pew, bring them to mind and see the blood of Christ pouring over them. You'll be doing what he wants you to do. His affections are there for you. Lazarus, come out and bind him. That's what he wants to do. And bind us and set us free. For he is the resurrection and the life. Even when we die and every time we hold on to these things, there's a little bit of death. And so we know I want to rise from that death. I don't even want to taste just a little bit. It's like taking a little bit of Clorox. Do you want to take a little bit of Clorox mm -hmm. every day? No, just a little bit. It's not going to kill you. I know, but just a drop of it. A drop of bleach is not going to hurt you. And you know, they've sweetened it now, by the way, you know. I don't even want a drop of it. And he comes to lift us from lies into his truth and from weakness into his power. So much does he love us. The Lord be with you. May almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are moving into the fifth week. Next week is Holy Week. Then we have what? We have the Last Supper. We will have the following, it'll be a week from today. We'll be into Holy Thursday, Good Friday, quiet of Saturday the weeping of the people. Can you imagine how they felt? And then Easter Sunday. Remember, they came to the tomb looking to anoint a dead body. And the angel said, he's alive. He is alive. God bless you. I'm going to show them the website. Oh yes, now Charmaine. Charmaine's coming, giving us some, some information. Hello, everyone. Um, Monsignor, thank you so much. Thank you so very much for this series of sessions. They were just over the top amazing and has given us all so much more to reflect upon and ways in which we can grow spiritually. Thank you. You all, I told Monsignor last week, um, in an email that one of the greatest blessings from this pandemic is having him assigned to our cathedral. Wouldn't you all agree? <laughs> Thank you. All right, if you all go to the website, a um, couple of things. So here's our website, www.stjudesp, so St. Jude SP. You go to our faith, you see the drop down. You go to adult faith formation, then you go then you all the way to the bottom to school of prayer, and you'll see the classes and whatnot that we've offered. So um, emotional healing and forgiveness, Lent of 2021 is here. Our previous classes are here. These are Monsignor Sipple's previous classes. But if you touch emotional and spiritual healing and forgiveness, you'll see that the class is here. And these and are his previous, previous sessions, sessions that you can listen to with the class notes. And, and I will enter the fifth one later tonight and his class notes tomorrow. If my, I may show you one other thing. Um, again, he is so gifted in all that he does. If you go to Our Faith and Catholic Resources, you'll see that um, there are homilies at the cathedral. Click that. And you'll see Monsignor's homily, just as the gospel reading and homily from today at 1130. There's also one, um, Father Pruel's 930, which was also just beautiful. But this page is loaded with um, the Sunday homilies and a few of the weekday homilies. And they're there for a month or so. Um, so that's here for you to listen to if, um, if you so like a little later today. Again, Monsignor, thank you so very much. <laughs> Good night, all, and I'll, I'll be sure to assign Monsignor some more classes here. <laughs> Please do. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, Monsignor. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Charmaine.
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, Charmaine, you. because we wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you, Charmaine. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Charmaine. You're welcome. God bless you. God bless everyone.